Okay. So let's start the session. Welcome to this session dedicated to sustainable finance for culture. Before I give the floor to our distinguished uh, speakers, I would like to clarify some definitions to avoid confusion. When I proposed to the Doc Institute this subject, sustainable finance for culture, I made it clear the issue was not philanthropy nor companies' charity programs, but sustainable investing. According to the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, sustainable investing is an investment approach that considers environmental, social, and governance factors in portfolio selection and management. It represents today an increasingly important part of overall investment, about $31 trillion. One strategy to implement sustainable investing is what we call impact investing. It means targeted investments aimed at solving social or environmental problems where capital is specifically dedicated to underserved individuals of community. It's clear that impact investors are prepared to compensate for lower financial income with a very important social, environmental, or cultural impact. The issue of our session today is to introduce this cultural dimension in this sustainable finance. On one side, culture, as we will see, is at the heart of sustainable development, but rarely on the sustainable finance agenda. The concept of sustainable development was defined in the 1987 Brutland Report. The definition is, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I recall this definition because we see cultural text on its full potential in it. And its conclusion, in its conclusion, the Brutland Report requires a global strategy that aims to promote harmony between human beings and between humanity and nature. We are in 1987, so almost 30 years before the Sustainable Development Goals. And again here we see that culture takes all its place in this global strategy. To complete this focus, one more word about cultural industries and the entrepreneur. This sector is very powerful in terms of revenues, employment, and influence. Revenues, in 2013, they accounted for more than 3% of the global economies. Our Ernst Wine study specifies that the cultural industry's sales worldwide exceed those of telecom services. Employment, they generate nearly 30 million jobs worldwide employing more people aged 15 to 27 years old than any other sector. In Europe, they represent twice as many employees as the car manufacturing car. Then, influence. By creating, producing, and distributing content, they contribute to promote critical thinking, mutual understanding, and people's willingness, or not, to live together. They include film, television, video games, architecture, heritage, museum, music, literature, performing and visual arts, publishing, radio, and more. It concerns what we listen, what we read, what we watch. This sector exerts a strong influence on the decisions we make, the products we buy, the questions we ask to make our everyday life. The stake here is not carbon footprint, but brain's footprint. It's brain's pollution, the stake. We understand then why responsible investors and sustainable finance have to integrate cultural dimension into their strategies. So after this focus, now I'm going to give the floor to my speakers. Uh, I will begin with Julien Ravalet casanova uh, Julien, you are a counselor to the Director General of UNESCO, Mrs. Audrey Azoulay, and through your previous experience, you are a specialist of, in economic diplomacy. So can you recall why and how UNESCO, for decades now, and through several reference texts, and in, in particular the 2005 convention, has consistently affirmed that culture and cultural diversity are at the heart of sustainable development of our societies? Merci Pascal. Merci Pascal. Um, so I would like to start to recall that the C for UNESCO means culture. Um, it means that from the very beginning, UNESCO has been convinced that culture and cultural diversity are the foundation upon which peace 
and through sustainable development and empowerment are built. Since then, means since the, big, the, la, the, the end of the Second World War, UNESCO and the, and the founders had been work on this issue, and the main success was the UNESCO 2005, the Convention of 2005, uh, the Convention on Protection and Promotion of Diversity of Cultural Expression, which was, was the first international instrument to highlight the unique value of culture in the field of develop, development. The Convention recognized the cultural goods and services have a value to can, that cannot be measured solely on economic terms. Cultural expression have also, uh, also have a social value. So why are we defending culture? First, we're defending culture because culture is peace. Culture forms a key part of our identities, as well as the fabric of a social cohesion and peaceful society. From Bosnia to Timbuktu, UNESCO ex worldwide experience shows that in the wake of conflict and crisis, it's culture that promotes reconciliation and recovery. We're defending culture because defending culture is defending the agenda of sustainable development, 2030. The agenda encapsulates thinking, uh, UNESCO thinking of the importance of culture for development in many ways. That's why now the organization is in the center of uh, and leading coordination on many, on many issues. I will, sing, I will quote just one example. The sustainable development goal number four uh, it's on education. We issue, uh, recently we published in September a figure that's very concerning. Um, there is, in 2018, there is 258 million children on the earth that are out, uh, that are out of school. It means uh, one, um, one sixth of the global population, global population of this age. There are many reasons to explain that. But there is also one reason uh, uh, of the disengagement of the young of the education system. It's because the, system, the education system is not relevant to their need and background. Whether in the form of local languages or, uh, or indigenous, indigenous cultural practices, culture makes education. And that's why we have to defend it. Culture also is uh, good for entrep entrepreneurship, innovation, and ultimately economic growth. Uh, it's often underestimated, but um, little know that right now the cultural and creative industry represents 2.2 billion USD annual revenue. The creative economy is one of the major, ec major economic sectors for the future. In addition to cultural tourism, which represents now around 10% of the global GDP. We defend culture because we believe also it's good for social cohesion. Um, when you defend the culture, you, culture you defend, you, it offers you us to opportunity to defend gender equality and also fundamental rights and freedom. That's why UNESCO is very engaged on this issue and will carry on within the next year. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Alain Bijek, you are the Secretary General du Centre des Cultures. Alain Bijek, you are uh, the um, director of the Cultural uh, Centre for Africa. So usually when we talk about culture, it comes after the basic needs. And uh, of, so is actually culture a lever to promote uh, the um, growth in Africa? Uh, thank you, uh, Pascal, for this question. And first of all, I'd like to thank the team of uh, DOC Forum uh, because this is a very um, interesting uh, meeting. So, Pascal, when we talk about Africa, it's important to understand what's at stake today in order to shape the future and finally have uh, cast a glance uh, in one's history and I would like to remind you that the African continent, as it was said uh, this uh, uh, morning, it's 1.2 billion people. So this is a huge pool of human resources. But for many uh, centuries, uh, the African, uh, Africans were displaced and they were forced to leave their 
uh, countries and these were um, really potent, dynamic parts of the population who are now living in the Americas or in the Caribs. Uh, so when I talk about that, uh, it was something that was reminded me this morning and my father used to say, uh, take a lion, put it in the water, in one hour it's a crocodile and in two days it's a fish. So the Africans uh, who leave the continent, they, wherever they go, they adapt but they um, really um, bring with them uh, jazz, soul, uh, uh, hip-hop, reggae, so all these musics have been born in Africa and we can find them everywhere in the world. So what is really fabulous with this culture is that currently in China, Korea, Germany, Russia, Senegal, Uganda, well, wherever you are in the world, all the young people speak the same language and they are practicing the same culture and they really understand that they are uh, actually doing that through the um, backbone of uh, African culture, which is music. And this has become universal and I think this is of great importance. And to go back to the African continent and its demographics, uh, this uh, morning someone reminded me that uh, um, looking ahead to 2100, uh, Africa will have uh, approximately 4 billion people. So one out of three humans will be coming from Africa. But when we look at uh, this 1.2 uh, billions, we are talking about 2,000 languages spoken on the African continent. Uh, an equal number of traditions, of narratives, uh, of dance, of uh, rhythm, of uh, folk arts, of visual arts, and this is actually a great capital for this continent. And when we're talking about uh, cultural investment, but before going into the economic details and financial uh, details um, and aspects, I would like to talk ab about the impact of this uh, capital on people because uh, these uh, music, these types of music have been uh, transplanted away from the continent but it was African musicians that went out there and talked about uh, what takes place in Africa, Miriam Makeba and many other great musicians organized for example uh, concerts in order to fight against apartheid uh, in South Africa and in Egypt it was the artists who finally uh, supported and uh, uh, the young people in uh, overthrowing uh, the previous president Mubarak and everywhere in the world it's the artists who are the avant-garde and bring uh, young people uh, forward in order to lead them to a liberation from themselves and a liberation of their creativity. So this is indeed a great lever that uh, players in culture uh, can press, pressure. Uh, so when we're talking about the cultural industry, we are representing a turnover of 40 billion dollars. This is too much and very little uh, because uh, Asia and the Pacific is 800 billions. But looking at the dynamic of this uh, cultural diversity, well, what we have in our hands right now is negligible because there are great and high stakes in order to allow us to really make this sector flourish through infrastructure and investment and Africa right now to go back to very uh, current issues uh, uh, is not um, evading uh, the uh, is actually a part of these uh, digital um, revolution and African creators and uh, musicians, composers can see the work uh, be propagated through streaming and 
attract the attention of audiences and captivate audiences in France, in Latin America, in Asia, and they can propagate their creativity and the message about Africa and really allow an international public to view Africa in a new way and contribute in um, a cultural debate. So when we're looking at uh, the digital element, there is this emergence of platforms also in our uh, continent, a very dynamic public, uh, which is actually approximately 60% uh, of uh, the African population, so the, we have many young people and we're talking about digital uh, era and um, of course uh, this can be very costly because the use of data on our, your phone requires uh, expend, uh, expenditure, it's, but we see that since they manage to do that there's also an increase of uh, the uh, salaries. So this is creating, generating income for everyone. So, of course, there are always um, issues. I let you present uh, your company. When Triodos Bank defines how it is impact, uh, the answer is, I quote, Triodos Bank's mission is to make money work for positive social, environmental and cultural change. And Frankly speaking, you are among the very few investors who have identified an integrated culture as a driver of positive change, along with social and environment. Why such a commitment to claim the contribution of culture in your impact criteria? Well, let me say a few words about Triodos to start. Uh, Triodos history started in the 1960s. You referred to the Brutland in, in 87, that that was 1960 whereby they created a foundation, and this for in individuals from the economics and legal background, that foundation said to savers, if you uh, give to us a part of your savings, we make the promise that we will invest this money only in projects that have a positive impact for people, planet, the environment, and the sectors we will target are the environment, social, and culture. That was right from the beginning, and that was in the 60s, so that was even before Britland. That, that's very close to sustainable development, be, even before the name existed. Now the bank uh, took a bank status in 1980, and is now with banking presence in the Netherlands, where it started, Belgium, the UK, Germany, Spain, and a banking intermediary in France. It also has a subsidiary called Triodos Investment Management that is... Um, uh, creating and distributing investment funds that can also operate in emerging markets and also in microfinance. In 2009, to widen its impact, it, the bank created a network called Global Alliance for Banking on Values of 50 banks uh, worldwide with a similar mission, social, environment, culture. In terms of size, it's 10 billions of assets, seven uh, managed 7, mil 7 billion credits, uh, 3 billion uh, for funds management, and all of that to foster positive environmental, social, and cultural change. Um, the vision on arts and culture, if I get to that now, uh, is that it is, for Triodos, it is used as a catalyst for personal and community development. What I will say with very much echo what you said, what you said, and what you said, because Triodos has been in this um, uh, financing of the cultural sector since the beginning, so we have a very deep knowledge of the sector. Um, connection is central to Triodos' vision on culture. And um, it finances uh, artists and cultural institutions that actually bridge and connect with society. There is indeed, uh, for social cohesion, it's also economics. Uh, because it creates jobs and, and revenues. Huh? And uh, also to connect with society is a combination of high artistic quality and broad audience. Uh, it means connecting with different parties to understand the sector, with public institutions, with uh, uh, sponsors, businesses, social institutions, 
Um, and uh, also the amateur practitioners have an important uh, role for social cohesion. So all in all, um, the cultural sector is very important um, as it can inspire and motivate change, personal development, vibrant civil society. It's versatile, it's dynamic, there's a lot of entrepreneurship in the cultural sector, and there Triodos has a good experience in uh, supporting uh, entrepreneurs for their financing, and that is also true for the cultural sector. The initiatives can be small or big, it, we, they are being financed regardless of their size. So, um, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what I could say. M maybe one last thing is that uh, um, Triodos is particularly keen on financing uh, initiatives in the cultural sector that combine um, different things, like a, a museum together with a theater and a restaurant to create really an area of uh, social activity around culture. Olga. Okay. You are managing partner at Falcon Group, uh, an independent investment advisory firm. Uh, being part of the financial community, in your opinion, what role culture does play in promoting the sustainable development of our society? And after Triodos, what would you like to add? Well, good afternoon. <laughs> first, first of all, I think. Um, I would like to add to what Patricia already said. I think in, in, in total, the element of culture and the ESG goals is nothing particularly new because it has been more embedded in a good practice of entrepreneurship, probably I even... Try this thing. Let me try the backup. Hi. Let, me, let, me, let me try this. Is this better? I can hear, but I don't know. Okay. Oh. Okay, sorry. So I, I wanted to start maybe by adding to what Patricia had said before and, and uh, take half a step back before we move forward. I think um, you know, the idea of culture and um, economic and social impact is not inherently new, but I think over centuries it, it was embedded in a good practice. Coming from Germany where we have a big ecosystem of family uh, owned um, uh, global companies, you know, many of these, when you look how they have expanded internationally, have de facto practiced good adherence to ESG principles over centuries because as they were expanding, the way to be economically successful was to have a ways also of managing the diversity in terms of the different types of people here that they have to work together. And at the end of the day, culture is related to people. And so, looking at the subject that we have today uh, and the element of culture, I think this number one involves culture uh, related to the past. So, kind of, you know, where do you come from as an individual or as a community, where you are in the present, and working together in the more and more globalized economy, then we come to the future. Um, today, in what we are doing, and uh, with we started Falcon about 15 years ago, mostly now focusing on infrastructure. Both internally, my team is consisting from six, seven nations. And then the moment we go into projects, which we have been doing and are doing in Central America, in Latin America, and in Africa, you, you have a whole mix of people there that has to get along with each other. Now, getting along with each other on the small level how to manage the cultural issues that you have in a group. And again, you already have this in most of the countries. Like in Germany, you may have a guy coming from Bavaria, working with a guy from Cologne, working with a guy from Hamburg. And they have cultural issues themselves. And I think on a bigger scale, it is the same thing but more complex, meaning you have to create an understanding for each other's background, it means that you have to nurture and develop the readiness to listen and even if you disagree to respect and I think how we try to do this in the projects as well and of course it has as a 
consequence, also a positive economic impact, mm -hmm. that we're trying to um, find ways of these people working together, whether, you know, by training things, by even more now, and I would like to come to this for the financial community in a minute, but uh, on one hand, it's very hands-on practices that I think, you know, again, you don't have to reinvent, they are there, but it has to be as a matter of awareness and as a matter of determination. And, uh, you know, the thing always starts at the top. You know, if the management and the board are not keeping an eye on it, it will all be lip service. And I think this is for me the big change when you talk about um, the uh, sustainability today. It's not necessarily a new, um, something that people just realize, but it is about awareness. And I think what we have to have today and why what we're talking about today is important, it's about accountability. So when you say something, how do you measure this? And if you measure this, how do you then account for that down the roads to really make sure that what you said that you were going to do, you have been doing, at least in the sense that otherwise you have to adjust. So for our proje uh, project, that means that uh, as part of many of the business plans, for example, in Africa, we are working on a new initiative called Go Green that is going to municipal and industrial organic waste primarily, but also plastic, turning that into energy. And this is involving the creation of a lot of jobs as well, but also then has opportunities for education. You know, we're talking here, um, uh, starting from the children, how to impact this. And of course, you can include in business plans all the nice language that, uh, you know, you will de facto uh, do something here or you do a little kindergarten there. But what is refreshing, and I think this is, the, this is a new momentum, is that IFC operating principles for impact investment have codified that earlier this year and the big boys are signing up to that. But, for example, in Africa where we are working with uh, great institutions like the Africa Exim Bank and African Development Bank, they are actually making it part of the business plan. And this is why I'm coming back to accountability, that you have to describe things more in detail. It is not enough to copy-paste something that you found on the internet, but you have to line out specific things and part of whether it's a credit approval application or uh, it is a equity financing thing people are looking at that because like good corporate governance if you do it right it has a positive factor so it's not a win-lose and I think it's not I, I would like to get this with my comments out of the donation box a bit but I think number one it has always been there good family-owned companies in all nations have practiced it in an institutional investor community, I think it has to have more awareness and we have to insist that we measure that. Otherwise, it is just, you know, propaganda. We'll see that later. Uh, David, you are a social entrepreneur and investor. So through your activity, you, you serve a social purpose and uh, you aim to improve people's lives. Uh, uh, so that you can generate a positive uh, return to society. So how do you take cultural dimension into consideration in your business? Yeah, th thanks. And uh, hello from Silicon Valley. I don't know, is this, I think yeah, this, works. this works, right? Okay. This works, okay. You have to put it. Uh, um, yeah, so a lot of people think about culture as uh, something from the past. And you know, for a lot of people, it is something something that's carried over through generations. But living in Silicon Valley, we kind of have a very different perspective of culture, uh, in a sense that we're thinking about creating the culture of the future. Of course, we all have our, our common cultures from from our families and our heritage, but we think about the common culture of the future and the investments we make in technology. Some of these technologies transform uh, lives and create brand new cultures. Um, I mean, for example, you know, the iPhone, right? The iPhone has created like incredible, incredible opportunities for so many people. I think one quote that I really like is that um, a person living in the jungles, um, in a jungle in Africa today has better access to information because of, of the smartphone than the President of the United States had 15 years ago. 
And so there's a, there's a lot of um, there's there's a lot of creation and creativity that happens that will shape the culture of the future. That um, I think, especially among young people, uh, will be very unifying, regardless of where people live. Like somebody earlier uh, today was talking about the fact that uh, people from different uh, different countries, different cultures, may have a lot more in common because of like their age group, right? I find that all the time. Like we meet people, young people from completely different cultures in different countries and they have so much in common because they grew up uh, you know, on these, using these technologies and, um, and so on. The, the thing is though that uh, a lot of people in Silicon Valley are creating uh, pro products uh, that are transformational and could transform like both social good and culture. Uh, well others, unfortunately we have a lot of smart people that are working on things that are not that important. So we have, and what, one of the things that I hope to transform in entrepreneurship is to get more entrepreneurs to think about ways to actually build transformational, important solutions to real world problems that affect billions of people. Uh, today we have a lot of in, extremely smart people thinking about uh, ways to make money without sort of the social impact. A component and it's unfortunate because the opportunity for entrepreneurs and for investors the risks and the rewards are similar in where you're working on something that completely is not important or on something that could become like massively transformational to the world and could solve real billion person problems so when I think about culture I think about creativity and I think about creators and I love creators if, to me, creators are people that are creating stuff. And they could be creating companies, or they could be, or technologies, they could be creating art, poetry, music. Um, anybody who's creating, actually film, film can transform a lot of people and impact a lot of people. Anybody who's creating something that could be transformational to billions of people, that could be inspiring, transformational, educational, that could change people's lives like in a massive way, to me is incredibly important and affects culture and affects, affects the future. So um, I, wanna, I want investors to support uh, investments in creators. And again, a creator could be a movie producer, could be a tech entrepreneur, could be an artist. But, and obviously not all creators are created equal and there's gonna be you know, quality creators that are gonna be talented, that are gonna create things that are truly transformational for millions or billions of people. There will be others that are not talented and obviously they won't get the investment and, and so on and so forth. Um, but my hope is that we're gonna see more and more investments that have sort of like a double bottom line where impact is important. And if this um, impact translates to millions of people, it will by default transform culture, right? So we kind of had a little correspondence by email where I was like, hey, let's talk about impact investment. And you're like, well, this is about culture. To me, impact investment and culture, they're very similar because like if you're, if you're impacting the world at scale, you're transforming culture. I see them as like being very, very, um, very similar and, and important. So, uh, you know, I always tell people um, that creating is better than consuming, yeah. right? It's more fun. It's more fun. It's, it's funner to cook than to eat, right? It's funner to write than to read. It's maybe. It's, it's cooler to create art than to look at art. It's just, it's more interesting to like design a company, company that can build technology than to just go to the store and buy the technology. That's not that interesting, right? And so creating is better than consuming. And again, creating anything, it could be a painting, it could be a company, that can transform and impact and influence millions or ideally billions of people will by default transform culture. And when I think about culture, it's the culture of the future. 
when you, you, you speak about technology, I, I remember a conversation I had with a, a female filmmaker from Congo, and she said to me, you know, uh, I live in a country when you have electricity, it's a good news, when you have internet, it's a, it's a miracle. So to link new technologies to creation can maybe sometimes be uh, tricky. And um, I would like to, to give now uh, the floor to Alain and, uh, and, uh, and um, to show a video because Alain, uh, you see you need Africa, just a moment. Because Alain, you are um, actually going all over Africa uh, in search of African talent. So, how do you do that? How do you access uh, uh, financing for these entrepreneurs who wish to invest in culture? So, uh, there is a short video of 60 seconds that shows one of these cases. <laughs> the other one. <laughs> En Afrique, on est dans une dizaine de pays, donc ajouter à cela la France, euh, l'Angleterre, le Canada, euh, ça fait à peu près 15 pays. Il euh, y a des pays qui sont en cours d'ouverture, euh, on communique déjà dessus, c'est des pays sur lesquels on est en train de préparer l'ouverture pour euh, fin d'année 2019, début 2020. The uh, subtitles... Um so our financial strategy is simple. From the beginning, my associates and I have been investing on our own. We have developed without external support, neither investors nor bank. We work on our own funds and invest our profits right back into the label. This strategic orientation is based on the following ascertainment. Uh, uh, there are parameters, uh, which I don't like to talk very much, uh, but they're real and uh, they believe that uh, artistic value still struggles to get recognition. So from this observation, financing is difficult to obtain. Oui, Pascal, pour en venir à... So to get back to your question, in fact, uh, uh, I'm going all over Africa. I meet many professionals in South Africa, Nigeria, Lagos, Senegal, uh, Ivory Coast, Cameroon, and I just came back from Kinshasa. So uh, the question of having access to financing is very important. Uh, uh, the case of so I guess it is a uh, quite important because investing in um, uh, cultural industry is always something that uh, takes uh, investors back. And very often when we talk about uh, uh, investing there, they just uh, nod their head and say, no, this is not going to be um, very profitable. But today, when we look at uh, the music industry is uh, 49 billions of dollars and this is only um, uh, when it comes to records so uh, you see that this is actually an industry that is creating jobs and uh, uh, generates revenue in Nigeria uh, the investors really understood uh, that investing in cultural industries and especially cinema and this is why we have Nollywood uh, which is the third uh, uh, film uh, industry in the world uh, it is generating $800 million every year. So when you think about the uh, local market, it's obviously uh, larger than that. And uh, when uh, Nollywood started emerging, nobody believed, but the um, film directors really went for it and they first created uh, the VHS industry because back then uh, we had VHS cassettes. And then it was DVD. Uh, however, there is this debate whether if it's not on film, uh, this is um, uh, really uh, an artistic creation. But however, now with Netflix, this has gone beyond, the uh, discussion has gone beyond that. So in Africa, we're still buying DVDs and CDs. And uh, today, 
to come back to Nollywood, investors finance films because they understand that there is actually uh, a public, uh, there is a demand. So in Nigeria, once again, we are investing in this market, but in the other, uh, the Francophone territories, they are not investing at all. Uh, and then we have uh, an extraordinary phenomenon that we have, uh, we have, uh, and let's hope that we will be able to replicate that. Uh, last year, uh, one company had an import, brought a, an important label, and they um, uh, increased the infrastructure uh, in uh, the music industry. And this year, the most important bank of uh, the Republic of Congo decided to invest in that project. Why? Because they um, met um, uh, with a partner that was able to um, support such uh, a project, uh, a sustainable project, because we're talking about music and Congo and Congo it has a great tradition in music and it's also a very strong local market and they have a, a, a great uh, um, musical production. So they decided to put in place an incubator to accompany music um, investors. Um, uh, and of course there has to be uh, some um, supervising of, of the investment. And there was... Um, uh, a contract between the bank, the institu institution, and the musical label. And all together, they worked, they put together the money, the expertise, the know-how, and of course, the talent uh, to um, create a very sound investment. And we hope that this type of uh, experiences will be replicated. There's also uh, the South Africa case. Uh, this, is an, a uh, this is a totally different Africa. It's uh, the best structured um, country when it comes to industri culture industry. They have trade unions and they invest in culture because they have um, uh, operators who are very close to what we have in the West or in the United States. So once again, these are two exceptions, uh, South Africa, Nigeria and Congo, of course. We know that in Kenya they are also moving forward and um, thanks to MPSI they, they have uh, now uh, a new um, label, uh, Batman King, and this allows, uh, allows streaming and uh, uh, people to have access to music through different platforms and uh, What's even better is that people uh, that music is generating income, and so, so uh, you can understand that uh, what will happen when all the countries uh, in Africa move forward uh, and start investing in uh, culture. And as David David said before, culture is future. So when we look at the African continent, the youth there. Uh, they have a, a great um, wish to work uh, with culture, to express themselves, to create, and Africans wish to express themselves, to see themselves in cinema, to see themselves in music, propagate the music, and uh, invest in the visual arts. So we need uh, two things, there are two things, uh, which is financing and make assisting um, uh, the artists to become more professional, create um, an environment that will allow them to um, really unfold uh, their talent and identify the partners. Because in fact, uh, when we're looking at all that, it's quite uh, difficult to, uh, to see who will be um, a good partner, but we have to identify them in order to create an ecosystem for cultural uh, investment. Thank you very much. Need for accountability and for transparency. Triodos explains finance is changing. And uh, I quote, because the more sustainable, diverse and transparent the banking industry, the more we believe people's quality of life will improve. 
So to answer uh, Olger's uh, concern about propaganda, how does Theodos measure this impact? What are your key indicators uh, to assess the impact of cultural um, industries when you invest in this sector? Okay. Um, and why? Why it is bankable for Triodos? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, the idea is to, to look at the projects that are financed and see what they generate for the society and, and, and the people. So for instance, uh, we can look at the number of people that have been reached by uh, programs financed by Triodos. But first of all, we need to know what we're talking about. So we need to define what we consider to be a cultural institution. So theater, museum, uh, uh, libraries, galleries, etc. We need to define who we consider is an artist. You are referring to creation, but when does it become really artistic? So it could be creating art, authors, individual filmmakers. Then we have to define what is a real creative company, uh, for instance, a filmmaker, a TV producer, a theater group. And then we can look at the number of spaces or the number of visitors to cultural events. That gives a, a, that's a, a, a fact. Um, you, uh, the same thing, you can look at the number of spectators to a film. I mean, you, you just derive that in all, in all uh, cultural sectors. In some countries, for instance in Spain, the government is actually taking care of calculating this. Um, for Triodos to publish the impact, as soon as we are a participant to the financing of a cultural project, we report the full project. We don't cut it into pieces, pro uh, that would be too complex. But that's the rule, and that's clearly indicated in the annual report. And uh, for Triodos, it's no different for the cultural sector than for other sector, as the bank publishes on internet all projects financed by the bank. And that also allows to see not only the quantitative aspect, but also the qualitative aspect, because when looking at a cultural project, you have numbers, visitors, uh, number of spaces, and so on, but there is also a qualitative impact that is best described by describing the, the project itself. In 10 lines, you, you get the picture. Now, in 2018, to be precise, um, the, uh, the Triodos group made it possible for about 22 million visitors to attend cultural events, including cinema, theaters, museums across Europe. Uh, that would represent 31 cultural experience per Triodos customer, defined at the end of 2018, that, that is um, 1,715,000 uh, 1, customers, each of them 31 cultural experience. And the bank helped about 3,060 artists in the course of the year. So, um, you can get real numbers, you can get real data that can be shown to, uh, to investors. And when it comes to how do you make it bankable, you say sometimes uh, investors turn off when, you, when they hear about to talk about to finance a, a cultural project. Well, when you are a, a bank or an investor, you need to know what you're doing. You need to understand the sector. So for banks and for sectors to invest, they need to invest time to understand who are the key players, what are the dynamics? What does it, what does it take for a project to be uh, uh, viable from a financial point of view? So there is the initial investment in, in understanding the sector as there is for any sector. So the way Triodos goes about that is that we work with government, industry association, consultants. We've been working on this sector since the beginning, so we have experience. And when setting up a financing for a project, we look, first of all, at what is the need for that project. Sometimes you need a place to operate, so it's going to be a real estate financing. In other cases, you need equipment, so it's going to be equipment financing. In other cases, it may be very short-term financing. For instance, the company has received a subsidy. They know it's secured, but it will arrive in one year or in six months. So that's pre-financing. That's very short-term. So basically the idea is to understand the sector, see who you can rely upon. There are guarantors that are specialized. 
In France, we can work with IFSIC, which is a state guarantor specialized in the cultural sector. And uh, you look at the need of the entity. You see if they have a viable business model with your knowledge of the sector. You, you, you use whoever you can work with. If you need more equity, you look at an equity provider. That's basic finance for any sector, just applied to culture. But the, what would stop financiers is not having taken the, taken the time to invest to understand the dynamics. Um, that yeah. would be how to make it bankable. So, uh, Olga, uh, there is a recent survey in France which shows that six savers out of ten want to have a meaningful uh, saving plan. And uh, when you listen to Alain or, or Patricia, uh, how could you convince your clients or the family you advise or in any way that to invest money in a film, in a fund that would uh, encourage film, uh, local filmmakers or museums or how, how, what would we need from Alain? As he said, the sector is not very well organized sometimes. What would you need to convince your clients to say it's a good choice because you want to invest your money but you also want something meaningful and you, you want evidence that your money is not going to be lost but maybe not as well as remunerated as a classical investment but at least you will have a real impact. What would you need to do that? Mm -hmm. I think um, you know, it, it is probably about I, I think this works better. So coming back, I think we have a, we have a saying, um, you know, in German, which kind of goes, you know, the, you, sh you should stick to your knitting, meaning I think it has in, in addressing the culture that from a financial perspective, um, we have to look at one angle, which is at some point always the financial return. Mm -hmm. And to achieve a cultural objective, have to partner with the ones who are coming uh, from the cultural uh, side of that and then balance it. So number one, I think it's about balance and understanding what you do best and what you do not do best. We are not typically uh, forming an opinion that is picking one over another proposal there, but the, uh, I will give you one element in a, or one example in, in a minute is about uh, probably creating a mix. And in the film sector, where I also have been active in my past, is that you are trying to find a project or some element where you are sure from the typical ways of looking at it that is your locomotive, you know, your winner. Because that locomotive also vis-a-vis -vis these investors who at the end also want to have a financial return. It is not that they are totally moving to non-financial. No, no, I said lower. Exactly, the criteria of judgment. So they want to balance that. So we try to find something in the plain vanilla definition of financial return and then attaching to this as an enabler and then attaching to this uh, some, if you want, playground. This means uh, coming back to the culture, one project we have worked on in the Emirates, which by definition is a, a melting pot of diversity, is a container-based real estate development that is both restaurants, shopping, and so on, but that intentionally has, a, if you want, space where we partner with, let's say, experts from the cultural angle mm -hmm. to keep filling that. And they get freedom in terms of who to pick there. So you, you partner with a jury, if you want, or a group of people who would then, in order to create a program that is of interest, to you know, actually have spectators there because the the one measurement for sure will be how many people are coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter how mm -hmm. creative or how spectacular it is in the eyes of a jury, mm -hmm. if at the end nobody comes, um, it be it's a little bit more of a self-entertainment thing then. So so. In that sense, some of the investments we have made from the real estate sector, you basically create an open space that from the perspective of real estate investment is conducive to and is inviting for people to come. How to fill that then, we would partner. 
we would go to Alain and say, okay, let's maybe we have, uh, uh, you know, new uh, music creators from Africa. We would try to find a similar thing from Asia, which also then from the audience that gets exposed to it almost sometimes by force, because these would be people that go out at night for having a meal or meeting friends and the cultural agenda to which you expose them is not where they have to pay necessarily for an entrance fee, but you tease them by coming in there. And the way then to get an entrance fee is this, the way that it has been done in the music industry for centuries. You have the Rolling Stones and then you throw at the people, whether they love it or not, two other groups, you know, that they have to eat. And you know they will come and so the next time they may not come because of the Rolling Stones, but this group that they have seen already and social media does the rest mm -hmm. today, they suddenly have discovered something. Because, you know, people sometimes are hesitant or stubborn or so, so sometimes you have to see if you force it on them. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in a nutshell, I think you have to balance that. You have to find uh, uh, something that they like and then to see how you can twist the human nature to expose them to something that they may like. D David, uh, you are a multi-award winning entrepreneur, uh, very successful, very visionary. So I would like you to, to, to do an exercise. Uh, if I give you three minutes to, to pitch a project in cultural sector industry, a startup, and you have to convince uh, both, as Olga said, Alain, in terms of content, you need to convince Olga. Patricia, maybe it would be easier, but who knows? And also UNESCO for the support of UNESCO. What, what would, would you do? You have, you know, like, like the, the new the digital economy, you have two minutes to explain the world. <laughs> I hate this. It, it, might, it might be used to that. <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> but you can send us a link so we can watch later. <laughs> well, here's the thing you guys have to make the investment decision here now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys have three track. minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so here's. Here's a company that I'm an investor in, um, and I'm on the board. Um, so th the company realized early on that the world became global, but there was about a billion people that were left behind. And um, the economy was global, but there's a billion people that are working hard, producing incredible things, but living in poor developing markets, small remote towns and villages and are really disconnected from the global economy. So this company is called Globin, and they created a marketplace that connects these artisans from developing markets, about 50 different countries around the world, to the global market, to the global economy, by enabling them to sell the things that they produce to buyers across the world. And uh, because uh, if we just created sort of like an online store or a marketplace, um, these people would sell probably one thing a year or something. It wouldn't be very sustainable and it wouldn't provide them with recurring income. This actually is a recurring subscription. So customers who are mostly American women pay a recurring $50 a month fee. $50 every month. And every month they get to choose the products they want from around the world, made, handmade by artisans in developing markets for their home. And sort of the thesis, so we invested three and a half million already into this company, uh, and our th investment thesis was that A, we believe that we want to connect a billion people to the global economy, but B, we thought that basically customers, uh, families in the United States, wanted to align how they spend their money with their values and did not want to buy things made in sweatshops for their home. They wanted to buy things that are handmade, fair trade, and authentic. And if that thesis was true, then essentially we're applying a recurring re subscription, sort of like a SaaS revenue model, to, um, to, to e-commerce. And enabling essentially people to get unique handmade things for their home from artisans and small entrepreneurs around the world through a recurring subscription model. And so the people in the emerging markets are getting recurring income. And what we've seen over the last few years is we've seen um, 
most of these artisans, by the way, are, are women, and about 100% of the customers are women, too. What we've seen is that uh, people in about 50 different countries are able, uh, a lot of these women that produce these things, they quit their jobs. They used to have to go sell on the local market. They don't do that anymore. They get, sell everything through Globo in a, in a recurring way. Uh, they've been able to send their kids to school, uh, build houses, in many cases make more than their husbands do. And um, it's one of these things where we're like, look, number one, we want to solve a real global problem. And if we can affect millions of people, it's going to be profitable and we're going to drive shareholder returns. Um, and so for us, like, there's a very clear alignment between mission, purpose, and, and financial returns. It was interesting because I was at the Fortune conference um, last year, and it was about sustainability. And they said, "What do you think about, um, you know, corporate social responsibility?" And like big companies, you know, creating corporate social, uh, you know, respons responsibility departments that are investing in, uh, in, uh, in things like that. And I kind of thought about it, and I said, "You know, I'm not sure because I think the companies I want to invest in." are companies who's, who are like 100% mission driven. In other words, words, what they're doing is the corporate social responsibility. There's nothing else. They're not doing anything else, right? Because co corporate social responsibility is like a company is selling oil, polluting, polluting oceans, whatever, and they have this little department on the side that's helping people, whatever, right? That's making them feel good. Like, I think that's bullshit. I think like what we should be uh, focused on is like, Companies that are actually designed, there's only one thing that they're here to do, which is to help solve real global problems, and that's why they're here. There's no separate department. The, the whole company works on this one thing. Um, so anyways, uh, that, that's, that's one idea. It's called Globin. We're, we're investors, and uh, if you guys want to invest, you can. Thanks. So, yeah. Olga, are you ready? Well, I, I, no, 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 I think joking aside, I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, the, uh, uh, would I invest here and now? I'm, I think my, my answer is a... No, I'm, no, no, I, I'm not joking at the moment. I think, you know, I would try to look at it at, an, at a more at a corporate finance slash, not so much as an investor angle, but I think to catapult that there, first of all, you need multipliers. So, you know, um, and I think one way that from our side we would look at this and saying okay um, you have something very tangible where you also uh, understand the way from the production to the consumer and I'd like to have with you a discussion you know how maybe we can bring you partners who pick up on that so that instead of the um, US audience that you have and that you probably I don't know how you get these men or women to to become customers there but so that we look how can we find uh, multipliers from the corporate scene because ultimately you know if I'm today looking for furniture shopping and, and, and what you said there mentioned that I would rather look at it and saying okay who else is already in this and who is maybe bored to give you a hint there of one of my ideas to just going to IKEA and, and have the same thing and you want to whether you call it limited edition or something mm -hmm. where you uh, create yep. a broader channel for this and Wholesale. so you Exactly, you have a wholesale element, but uh, but you you broaden, so to say, the potential audience for that. Because other than that, I think it's a brilliant idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, wholesale is definitely something that we're thinking about. You know, and and like I said, uh, uh, IKEA, in a positive sense, has a lot of uh, uh, stuff there. But you know, you can spice it up probably. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You want to cooperate or not? I have to, to call global. Paris first. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a, a remark about CSR. CSR is, is as you say, it's, can be separated, but less and less CSR is separated because now CSR is something which creates value for the company and it has to be understood at the beginning of the business uh, to, to be able to anticipate any risk or opportunity dealing with the impact you may have on society. So. It's less and less separated, I think. That's true, actually. Yeah, we, we are seeing like uh, mm -hmm. old school businesses that are taking like, like it used to be like a side thing, and now they're making it a lot more front and center. And one of the reasons is that their employees 
are basically forcing it, right? Basically, you have like 2,000 Amazon employees that just walk out because Amazon's not doing anything about climate change. And so Amazon says, okay, well, now we have to like actually take it seriously because we just lost like a, you know, a week of productivity. So, so now it goes from like being a side project to like actually being front and center because the employees are actually forcing the issue on, uh, on social responsibility. Um, to, um, just I, I wanted to say something about uh, what you said about Netflix in Africa. Um, I asked my students to work about the role of Netflix to promote uh, creativity in Africa. And what they said uh, is that out of 6,000 films in the catalog, there were only 21 films from Africa. And uh, out of these 21 films, 17 were coming from Nigeria. Which means that, again, before being accessed, uh, it's not to be well or not, but it's a question of business model for Netflix. But how, when you are a young African filmmaker, you pretend to be respected and have your dignity as a creator uh, recognized when you don't, you don't have access to this representation of the world? So this is a very big issue. That's why it's very important to, to continue to support filmmakers because it's, technology is something, but to be part of the content is a great challenge. Um, Ju Julien, so you would have the word. So when we hear, because we had all stakeholders here, we had finance, we had entrepreneur, we had institution, we had artists. Uh, how could UNESCO convince responsible investors uh, to integrate in the impact investing approach the cultural impact? Because as Ogre said, it's easier now to invest in uh, a startup which uh, recycle waste because everybody thinks about climate change and it's, which is fundamental. But it's not true that about culture, we have the same uh, impulse. And I think it is necessary to have this impulse because as I said about Netflix, you cannot ask, uh, as you said, uh, millions of young people, uh, once you know how to recycle your waste, you, you will be part of the creativity world. It's, it's not possible. When you are young, you want to be part of the debate. You cannot wait for age, age, ages and ages. So how UNESCO could be more offensive? Sorry, Julien, uh, maybe it's not a diplomatic word, but to, 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 to make people understand, because you have, again, a wonderful text uh, that set out priorities, objectives, goals, impact measurements, to, to, to be on board, to, to create this, this environment. Um, to respond to your question first, um, I will say, um, I will respond on the contrary. I think, I believe that culture can be very profitable, can be a good opportunity of investment. And this is the first thing that we have to say. Uh, can offer lots of uh, growing perspective, and especially if we think about uh, creating the culture of future, as you say. Um, again, figures, 3% of the global GDP uh, it comes from the creative economy. It represents 30 million jobs. More, uh, lots of young people, lots of women. This is something very interesting if you think about the future and if you want to invest, you think about the future. Um, UNESCO has been pushing for that and now it's starting, wants to really push more and engage the private sector into this sector, these issues. Um, in a few weeks, there will be a big conference, uh, what we call General Conference. 120 Ministers of Culture will come to Paris, and this issue um, will be addressed, especially. We are doing many things uh, to promote that uh, around the world. Just a few, two or three initiatives. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the Creative City Network, UNESCO Creative City Network. We have like 180 cities all around the world, I mean in 72 countries. Um, this is working well. We, 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 we push for um, a creativity and then it could create an ecosystem and create jobs, employment, econo the economy is growing thanks to that, thanks to this institution that we are putting on these cities. We have an ex uh, uh, right now a project that is very important for, for the managing director of, uh, of UNESCO, Madame Azoulay, is, um, it's called Revive the Spirit of Mosul. Uh, I don't know if you heard about, but Mosul in Iraq has been completely destroyed. 
by, uh, by the hash. And we are now about to really rebuild the, this city. Why is it important? It's not only rebuilding this very old mosque, uh, world heritage. Of course, it's important. But this will create economic activity, jobs. People will get new training. They will learn new jobs as well, new, new, get new skills. Then Mosul will come back as a city of dialogue. And it will, um, I would say, uh, improve the economic and the, the, the situation in the region, especially the economic situation. And then it will create opportunities in any sectors in the cultural sector, but through the culture, through the restoration of the, path of the heritage, we can, we can create uh, growth, actually, locally. Um, if you invest in culture, you, c you can, in a way, invest in the protection of uh, the environment or, or fighting the climate change. I'll give you just one example. Um, you want to invest in the protection of uh, humanity in tangible cultural heritage, for instance. Uh, this includes safeguard, safeguarding traditional agricultural practices and knowledge, which will be able to help us in the future to innovate the sustainable development for the future. So, so you invest into that, in a way you invest in another way for, for the environment, but you protect culture locally. Um, to conclude, I will say, um, you, you, you say responsible investors, I will discuss this, maybe this word, um, investors that want to invest in culture uh, are investors that are prepared to be committed over the long term. C investing in culture is for the long term, rather than a, show, than on a spot. It's for investors that want to make a uh, last impact. Culture has an ability to create uh, over decades, even centuries, uh, what no other sector is able to create. This is why UNESCO is really pushing for that. This is why we want to engage the private sectors with us on our project. And this is why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do, you, do you have uh, two or three minutes for questions from the audience? Or no? Okay. I don't, we have to finish in five minutes. Ah, okay. No question? Okay. Oh, no. no? Okay, so I will, uh, I will give the floor maybe, to... Maybe the, there are, are questions? Are there questions? One, one question? Yeah. I cannot see anything. No? No? no. no? Okay. No question. People are tired of the time. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to give the floor to Berthold now to have his uh, conclusion remarks. Yeah, thank you, Pascal. Today uh, is actually our second uh, DOC event on sustainable uh, finance for culture, for culture and uh, social cohesion. Uh, the first one uh, we had in, in Paris at the premises, uh, at the headquarters of, of UNESCO. And DOC has teamed up with Respetica, it's a, it's a French advisory firm, to launch this new action research initiative on sustainable finance for culture. And I think we've ventured into a quite insightful uh, debate and you have uh, uh, made it very clear that culture is the global connector. And uh, working towards the sustainability agenda, we need to go beyond the ESG criteria, which are known to most of you, I suppose, are uh, uh, environmental, social, and governance criteria. And uh, the C criteria uh, uh, might fit into the S uh, uh, criteria, but actually it's much more. We need a kind of a fresh thinking and understand the potential of, of culture to promote uh, creativity, social cohesion, harmony between people and uh, societies. And what we are trying to do is, first of all, in this research project, we would like to assess the, the relevance of, 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 of culture in current sustainability discourses. The answer may be that uh, the relevance of culture is still relatively low, and we are looking into strategies, into communication strategies, how to 
uh, make, uh, give culture a more prominent place in the sustainability context. I think that is also very much in the interest of uh, UNESCO and the, the arts uh, industry. And we have some pioneer financial uh, uh, institutions like uh, Triodos, and there are a few other ones. And we have uh, entrepreneurs and, and investors on board. So I think we had a nice gathering of different uh, stakeholders, uh, and we are jointly engaging in, in, in further uh, uh, promoting this debate, uh, sustainable finance for culture, uh, contributing to social cohesion. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand Diamond. We have a question. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Mohammed Bashar Arafat, Imam in the Washington area, and I work with different programs with the State Department. And I do trainings for Imams from all over the world, as well as clergy in the United States. The topic that you are talking about, have you shared this with religious leaders in order to convey this to their followers in the churches, in the mosques, in the synagogues? Have you tried to also engage religious leaders to convey this message to their uh, followers? Don't you think this is important? Because this is what I work on in the United States. But in case I would like to share this, have you ever invited to a conference that you know, address this issue, but for religious leaders. I could. I think we are very much at the beginning of this initiative, but uh, in May this year, I was in Israel and in Palestine, Palestine, and I've talked to some religious leaders about it. Unfortunately, they have a parallel conference, so they couldn't make it today, but definitely they have a strong interest in, in, in uh, pointing out to the importance of culture and civilizations in the context of sustainable development. And they also feel that cultural aspects are somewhat underrepresented in the uh, Agenda 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, framework. And uh, I think even this morning, I mean, the president of, of, of Niger, he referred to some uh, potential investments in, in Africa related to green finance, to sustainable finance, and, uh, and possibly also to sustainable finance for culture. I'm sorry, I didn't get all your question, but what I can say that uh, dealing with investment, we, it's quite new, but dealing with companies who work in this sector, it's not that new. A lot of museums, a lot of uh, TV or, or media company, at least in Europe, and I, I spoke with Disney, for example, about CSR, they, they have in mind that they can contribute to sustainable development by their films, their content. So it's something which begins to, 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 uh, to, to, to grow. But the problem when, that's why CSI is a very integrated process, because if a company, a media company, uh, has a good CSR policy in terms of knowing what is its impact in terms of culture, but if in front of this company investors are obsessed by climate change, they will ask this company, what is your carbon footprint? That's why at the beginning I said the issue here is brand footprint, because it's easier to, for a media company to, to answer questions about CO2 rather than asking them how they uh, promote uh, freedom of expression, how they, they, they promote diversity of uh, talent. This is a complex issue. So that's why we need a dialogue and we need to be a community to ask the same question and to have the same obsession about the role of culture in sustainability. Yeah. Otherwise, and I'm a bit uh, uh, um, uh, reserved about the sustainable development goals because uh, in comparison with the 2005 convention of UNESCO, uh, the sustainable development goals are quite timid dealing with the industry of, uh, of uh, media because they, are, they address issue about water, but uh, the biodiversity, gender equality, but they don't really address the core of their business. 
And uh, that's why for investors, it's easier to say, okay, I'm good with the 17 SDGs, but I don't really understand uh, the real impact of this media. So that's why you have to be concerned. And civil society, NGOs, investors, and companies have to put this at the head of the agenda so that we can share at least what we expect from the future. So one more question. Thank you, Rebecca. My name is Peter Musaferiadis, and I'm from Cultural Infusion in Australia. I wanted to ask a question around how culture can be used as a driver for innovation, especially around diversity of expressions. And when you bring many different um, uh, cultures together from an anthropological perspective, that can be a great driver for creating something completely new. Is anyone from the panel able to speak to that? Could, could you maybe repeat it because I think we had, we had an acoustical problem. We didn't hear your question properly. Apologies. Come, 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 come closer. Come, come to the table. Yeah, come, yeah, come have a seat. Let's discuss. We have a seat here. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Come, come. Okay, my name is uh, Peter Musafiriadis, and I'm from an organisation called Cultural Infusion, okay. and I've been working in the space of you know using uh, culture as a driver for uh, innovation and building into cultural understanding, uh, and we take sort of a broad approach to culture, especially from an anthropological approach, and how communities and you talked about you know 2,000 languages that are spoken in uh, Africa, and there's probably another seven eight thousand ethnicities connected to that. That when you create dialogue, intercultural dialogue, you begin to create a diversification of ideas which leads to innovation. And we know that from you know, studying history or if you look at Creole culture, which means the culture of the colonies. Has there been much research done around that from any of you guys or could you talk, could you talk to that at all? Is UNESCO able to maybe speak to that? You understood it? Sorry, can you maybe rephrase that? So I think one, one thing that you said, so what if you have all these different languages or dialects, and if you, that is the starting point, uh, and, and then... So I'm, I'm, I'm referring to culture as a driver for innovation, and leading to artistic or creative innovation. Mm -hmm. okay. Has there been any research done around that, or any support for some of the initiatives that you're supporting across the world that look at creating new innovation, which brings maybe different cultures coming together to create a new artistic outcome? Because you know the lifeblood of culture is confluence, and culture is constantly evolving. I can respond in French. Do you understand French? Okay. Well, I tried recently. I organized in several um, places, events, and I allowed two artists who didn't know each other through uh, a, a common platform to create together. So in innovation, there are camps. And in uh, music, we organize a songwriting camp. So uh, with the same, uh, um, within the same context of creation, you put artists who don't know each other uh, and you uh, set some, define some specific uh, goals. So we asked the people who uh, didn't know each other uh, to create and we had a beat maker artist and we told them well you have the possibility to create every day and at the end of these three days we must have a disc they didn't know each other these are artists and they were all uh, uh, animated and uh, so happy to work and they 
um, found a common land, a common uh, language, which was music. And um, recently the same went for, uh, we asked that, to repeat that, and we can do that with different uh, forms of art. It could be um, some, yes, for example, 10 years ago we had a program in Europe that was called Diversidad. Uh, and it united artists from all over Europe because there were all these new countries that had just uh, adhered to the European Union, and they were to create together Polish people, Portuguese, French, uh, Germans, and they could create together within a similar uh, experience. So um, when you put creators, content creators together in a specific context, they create something new because there are new uh, narratives, new points of view, there's something magical that happens. And I think that uh, this is a true innovation. So by using uh, management uh, tricks uh, of the trade, you can allow culture to flourish even better. Thank you very much and I hope to see you soon.